me. What salvation is done for me? And it's a heart. It's a who? A heart. A heart? Yep, there is. That's a heart. It's the word heart, and it's supposed to be in the shape of a heart. Very good. Very observant. Romans chapter 10, verse 9. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Amen. That's all just lit. played out there a little bit with the mouth, your heart, from the dead, and so forth. So, what salvation is done for me? Let's hear about what salvation is done for us.
influence in the things of God and to the cause of Christ. Just living out in the world. And like the Bible said back in Genesis 6, we know it's just going about and doing what people do in life. Getting married, paying bills, living, having kids. You know, just all the things that folks do. But there's something greater at work here. This morning for our Sunday sermon, we're going to be going to the good doctor, Dr. Luke's uh, gospel. Luke chapter 9. We're looking at verses 57 through 62 and then verses 14, 25 through 33. And this will probably act as a introduction slash segue uh, from our last session in Bible study, when we were looking at the New Testament doctrine of the church, we're going to now look into some uh, discipleship and being a disciple and what that entails and what it looks like. And as we found out what the work of the church is to do, and that we're to go be there for, we have to have disciples, right? And we need to find out what it is we're supposed to do and how we're we supposed to get this done and what type of uh, people are we to look like, you know, as far as disciples. And discipleship is concerned, uh, in, uh, concerned in the church. So this morning, prayer for that as sort of a mini introduction to our study that we'll begin on this Tuesday. We'll begin to look at discipleship. So Luke chapter 9, uh, verse number 57. Of course, we have in Luke's gospel, Christ sends the disciples out uh, two by two, or they send sent out to go and to preach and to minister. And the multitude is fed. Peter makes his great confession. We have the transfiguration. And then there uh, come to some tests of discipleship here at the end of chapter 9. It says, and it came to pass. That as they went in the way, a certain man said unto him, so it's just someone in the group, Lord, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. You know, Jesus, I'm with you all the way. And Jesus said unto him, he turns and looks at this man, foxes have holes, and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head, or nowhere. And when and he said unto another, Follow me. But he said, Lord, suffer me or permit me first or allow me to go and bury my father. This is somebody who's following Jesus now, but obviously his mind is on other things. Jesus said unto him, Let the dead bury their dead. But go thou and preach the kingdom of God. And another also said, Lord, I will follow thee, but let me first go bid them farewell which are at home in my house. Let me just tell everybody hi and give them a hug and all this kind of stuff. And I'm with you, Jesus, but let me just hold up, hold up. And then lastly, Jesus said unto him, No man, having put his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. Luke's Gospel, further in chapter number 14 now, verse number 25, Jesus continues to speak along this vein about counting up the costs of discipleship. And it says, And also, and there went a great multitude with him. So again, a great number. And he turns and looked at those who are following him and says, If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. This would disqualify one from being a disciple of Christ. And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me, cannot be my disciple. For which of you intending to buy a tower sitteth not down first and counteth the cost, whether he has sufficient to finish it? Lest happily, after he hath laid the foundation and is not able to finish it, all that behold it began to mock, saying, This man began to build. He wasn't able to finish it. Or what king going to make war against another king? Sitteth not down first and consult, excuse me, and consulted whether he be able with ten thousand to meet him that cometh against him with twenty thousand. Or else, while the other is a great way off, he sendeth an, an, amb an ambassage and desireth conditions of peace. So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. Christ, I mean, it's very plain. It does sound rather poignant. It's, uh, you know, it can seem kind of hard. Oh, Jesus, like, I can't go tell my mama, bye. You know, I want to, they, they got a going away party for me. They're going to they gonna celebrate and do this for me. I can't go see my family. Sounds kind of rough, doesn't it? But Christ put it out there as such. This morning, for just a few minutes, we're going to talk about the demands of discipleship following the leader. The demands of discipleship. If we don't know, and probably if you just read this, write along with me. Go back and read it again before I start preaching. It costs us something to be a disciple of Christ. It does. Okay? 
It may not cost you any amount of money or no secret handshake. Or there are no hazing rituals, but guess what? It costs you something to follow after Jesus Christ. It's something we shouldn't take lightly. It's something we should haphazardly just jump in and say, oh, I'm feeling bad. And my mom been praying for me. They, my big mom keep getting on my nerves. I'm going to go on out to the church and let them baptize me. And I'm going to do, careful, careful, careful. It shouldn't be based on peer pressure or feeling or emotion. It should be a call from God the Father unto you to follow who? His yeah. son, Jesus Christ. Yeah. That's what it should be about. So when we talk this morning about the demands of discipleship and following the leader, if you were called as a kid, when you played the game, you ever played the game, follow the leader, right? We follow the leader, we, you know, quote out, do what the leader does. So if the leader is walking with his left leg up his hand, look, if we follow the leader, what? We do the same thing, right? No, you follow the leader, right? You want to play the game because if you were found not to be doing that, then you had to do what? You had to get out of line and get out of the game and it kept on going. Almost kind of like Mother May and other kind of stuff, but it was simple as a little kid and prayerfully, when you played this game, you didn't have a, I ain't say even a foolish leader up front. They just have you doing crazy, stupid stuff just to mimic what they do. You know, they scratching heads and doing stuff. Because sometimes we'd have a little crazy kid you follow. And they would do just goofy stuff to have you look stupid. Ah, look at y'all. Man, we follow the leader, right? But we have to be careful. Because sometimes as we follow the leader, the world seems to just be marching right along, just going with the flow. And whatever happens, just follow the leader. If your 2016 is left leg up, all right. Come 2017, it's okay, we're going to do it right leg up. We just follow right along. Don't question why. Don't ask why. Don't realize that, man, look, I need to walk with both my feet on the ground. I'm just going to follow after what they do, right? I'm just going to look the part and be like everybody else. That's the way it looks sometimes in our world. When we talk about following the leader, we're going to give you a quick definition, a short definition of what a, a follower of Christ is, a disciple. And it's a follower who is committed to a recognized leader or teacher. And it's important here that we understand it's a recognized leader or teacher. A lot of folks follow after folks, but their leaders ain't big more recognized. <laughs> right? Like Just like a little game, you follow the leader. You're following that leader, but that leader is not recognized. They ain't number some little kid off the street or your cousin or your brother who you're playing with. They pretty much, like my mom would say, ain't running nothing but their mouth. You're just a little kid out there just talking, whatever. But mom, we playing this game. Boy, you better, oh, yes, ma'am. I mean, that's it, right? But we have folks, and when Jesus Christ came on the scene, and began to call disciples or followers, there were other folks on the scene, you realize, that had disciples as well, right? They weren't necessarily maybe recognized, but there were folks who followed this particular sect or followed after this path or this tradition. So they would be, for all intents and purposes, disciples. But when we talk about being a disciple of Christ, we're following him. We should be committed, right? And it says to a recognized leader or teacher. But the key word there is that we want to be committed to him. We don't want to just haphazardly follow after our Father and Savior, Jesus Christ. So when we look at following the leader and the demands of discipleship, check this out. Sometimes in the world today, when you follow after folks, look at it. She's playing, anybody know this game? Hopscotch, right? I don't know if kids play that no more. But I remember back in school, and I, on our blacktop, they actually had, you had to use chalk. They had the, had the line on there with a little yellow paint so you could see it and you could do your little thing. But hopscotch, one, two, three, four, all the way up. But what's waiting over the edge of the slip? I mean, what that means? Ain't no telling. A lot of air. Amen is making sure it's a lot of air. And look at all these kids, you know, these little kids down here, all this kind of stuff, getting ready to follow after. And unfortunately, in the world today, people just follow the leader and not realizing what we're doing, haven't, haven't thought about it or considered. We just follow them blindly. And we're going to follow them right off the wood, the edge of the cliff. And we seem like we've been doing that today. We continue to do it. We keep following, and sometimes a leader goes down, and what do we do? We don't have enough sense to. Take off and say, I'm not going to do this. We do what? We follow right on off the edge as well, don't no. we? Christ is speaking this morning. And I can go back to Luke's gospel in 57. It says, and as they were going along the road, someone, just somebody out of the crowd, said to Jesus. And it's important to realize, when you have folks following after you, everybody that follows after you, that doesn't mean they're necessarily agreeing with you. Right? They're not necessarily what? Committed. That's the word we're talking They're not a committed follower. Some are just following because of peer pressure. I ain't have nothing else to do. It looked like, you know, y'all were going to get something to eat. You know, whatever the reason is, they don't bit more care about the cause or the this or the that. Folks are just lined up just to be part of a crowd, part of a group. They, they can get on TV. I'm going to get on the news. I'm going to just go down there. And, you know, we had all the protests. You remember with the Mike Brown stuff and all this other kind of stuff. A lot of folks are going to show up just to be there. Folks from out of state, across town, just showing up to be a part of what was going on with it. 
were necessarily about a cause. They didn't even know the kid. They didn't know where that was. They said, it was a bus leaving. Going to take you here. We'll give you a sandwich. Come on and ride with us. We going to Missouri. And folks just got on and went there. Made a whole lot of what? A whole lot of trouble. So when we talk about that here, Jesus says, uh, someone out of the crowd says, Jesus, I will follow you any place you go. Careful now. Jesus turns. Jesus doesn't just haphazardly accept that. Right? What does Jesus do? He reminds him or he makes him aware of, okay, now look at what you're getting into. Jesus says what? Foxes have holes to live in or dens, and the birds have nests. But the Son of Man has no place to rest. He said, Jesus said, I don't have no big, no big church, no big dorm, no big whatever to come take you to, brother. He said, we just kind of go where we go. You know, we don't have a big, a big pot of money. We don't have a this or a magic. He said, if you follow me, you, you know, we're on our own out here. I'm just letting you know that. Okay, that's what he says here about this father. Then he says to another man, he looks and tells him, come on, follow me. But this man says, Lord, first, uh, let me go and bury my father. Okay? Look at all these different things coming amongst the group. Somebody says, okay, Jesus, I'm going to follow you. Christ reminds him of what the, uh, the, 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 the uh, following him looks like. Here is someone who wants to follow, or Jesus demands him to follow. Him, and he says, well, let me go do something else. His mind isn't there. Right? He hadn't really counted up the cost of the man's discipleship. He just followed the group. And it says here, Jesus said, let the people who are dead bury their own dead. You must go and tell about the kingdom of God. You have a work to do that unfortunately you can't be bogged down with some of all the trivialities here of the world today. You, you, you have a mission. You have been commissioned. You have something in church. We've been commissioned. We have a job. We have a duty before us. We can't afford to get bogged down in all the, I don't know, the whimsicalness of the world. Or just whatever's a hot item today and we want to go and march and pick it. Like I said, Satan loves to do that. It's like military warfare. If he can not kill us off but maim or slow us down to where we're infighting or fussing with these people who they ain't going to be more change, they sin us, they're going to do what sinners do. We leave them the word of God. We give them the gospel of the good news. Hearts can be changed. Lives can be touched. But if they're not willing to, to change, we give it to them and we move on and do what? Go share it somewhere else. You don't spend your whole ministry trying to, you know, work on one person. Man, please. There's a lot of other people going to hell in the meantime. Share with them, right? The duty of changing that heart is who's God. To me, when I realized that as a young believer, that was one of the most freeing things about salvation. Is it wasn't my job to save people. Really, just to share. A lot of times, folks will keep pushing. You know, it's almost like you, like a car sale. They try to sell you something. They're not going to let you leave that lot till you do what? Have some keys in your hand. Because that's their job. Their goal is to do what? Get them numbers up. Make a sale. Make a sale. Make a sale. As the gospel, is that our goal? No. To, to, make, to close the deal? No. We're simply to put it out there. The deal closer is God himself. Is the Holy Ghost. He closed the deal. God draws men to what? To himself. We simply put it out there. Plant seeds and water. The Lord, the Bible says, yields the increase. But that was so freeing for me. Because we would, as a little kid, we go out and do what they call street ministry. We go out to the neighborhood and talk to people, knock on doors. And sometimes, you know, people come in, oh, man, this lady, she said she accepted. And a lot of them people may have just been saying that for us to leave them alone. Who knows? You are on one side. No, they ran on the other side. But a lot of people walked. But a lot of people felt like I had to keep doing, I had to keep doing. This person had to come to Jesus. You got to come to church with me next Sunday just to show off and to say something. But I realized, guess what? It ain't my job to save anybody. They're supposed to be following me as I follow Christ, not just me. But see, we get upset and think something's wrong with us because folks don't immediately bow down to what we say. And they don't like me enough. I wasn't nice enough. They don't think I'm whatever enough. And they didn't just come on and fall down crying, accept Jesus, and come to church with me. People have a whole lot of other stuff going on in their lives. Right? Some folk, can I go do this? Can I bury my mom in them? Can I do this? Can I go back and tell? We continue on. Another man said in verse 61, Jesus, I will follow you, Lord. But first, let me go say goodbye to my family. Jesus said, anyone who begins to plow a field but keeps looking back is of no use in the kingdom of God. If you plow in that field, you got this animal before you, you need to see what? See where he's going. That animal don't, doesn't know what you're doing. Do you think when folks get out there and have donkeys and over in other countries where they have water buffalo or whatever, and they're out there plowing the field, does that animal have any idea what it's doing? No. That's a beast of bird. You, you're training that thing. You've got it under your submission to do what? Pull till I say what? Don't pull no more. And a lot of times when they don't want to work, they have to do what? They have to kind of put a little something on it and make it do what? Make it move out. That animal doesn't realize that what he's doing is not only going to benefit you, but he's going to benefit as well, right? Some of the stuff that you're planting or whatever, maybe fed to that animal. He don't know that. That animal feels like, look, I got this burden on me. It's hot out here. This thing is heavy. I don't want to do it. But that animal is simply just moving because so when you take off, this animal needs some direction, right? 
So if you try to go and you're looking back on whatever this way, what are you going to get done? Your roles may be crooked. You may dig away. You can't do that. You can't put your mind to this task before you but continue to look back and like, man, I wish I was back in the house. Yeah. you got to get out here and do what? Get this work done. Amen. So we talk about following the leader. And sometimes the leaders that we follow in the world today, here's another example. We do this, that, we go ahead on here. Reminding us again that a what? A disciple is a follower who is what? Committed. Because the problem is when you have folks who are not committed to your cause, this is what you have, okay? She says, follow me. Somebody in line follows you and says, why? Why am I doing this? Somebody else says, ooh, it's fun. Somebody thinks it's a race. Somebody here is talking about I'm flying. You're supposed to be walking like the rest of us. You're as fast as I am. I've been practicing. And then this other person here again, why am I here? From this little example, this little picture right here, this is some of the same thing that happens in life for folks with the cause of Christ. They don't know why they're doing it. They're just showing up. Why am I even here? What am I doing? Some folks think it's fun. Some folks come to church because they think it's fun. It's a show. Let's see who's going to do what today. Let's see if Sister so is going to shout in her wig and follow. Ooh, last Sunday, you remember that? Yeah, they got it on the camera. I seen it. And they're looking for something fun or exciting. It's not about fun and or exciting. There is a work to do. And Christ is reminding them at the beginning here that there are some demands of being a disciple, a committed follower of Jesus Christ. Not just somebody just haphazardly going along to get along. Right? Because folks will follow folks out in the world all day, as we looked at here a moment ago. Folks will follow people out in the world all day, and we end up just like this, off the cliff. We follow and follow, and just, just pure, leading to destruction. Folks that have no sense of direction, they can't see any further than you can. Just like I don't know what's happening out there, they don't either. But guess what God does? I do the, believe the Bible I read tells me he said I'm Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. So if I follow, amen, that's a sheep, baby. If I follow after him, he's going to direct me and take me where I need to be. But I want to be that committed. I can't be following Jesus today and say, oh, Lord, I'm tired. I'm going to sit down. I'm going to take a break, Lord. I'm going to take a couple of Sundays and just do me. Right? And there again, I ain't talking about taking a couple of Sundays like missing church. But when you talk about doing this and, Lord, I'm not going to give you any regard. I'm just going to clear my mind of whatever. I'm going to do what I want to do. Lord, wherever I am, if I may not be in church on Sunday, guess what? You're still in here. Right? I just shared with you. My wife and son were in Texas on last week. They went and visited church. My in-law, but their minds were still stayed on you. They didn't get to Texas and just forget they had a family and start kicking and doing whatever they want to. This was still my wife who happened to be in Texas. This was still my son who happened to be in Texas last weekend. They were still part of this family. They're just another another location. As Christians, don't we sometimes have to separate? Right. Young folks, this young man here may be going to school pretty soon, right? Once he separates, he's still a Christian, right? He's still a member of our family, a member of our church, leaving to go do whatever, to matriculate, as they say, to the higher halls of education. Still going to do that thing, but he's still taking God what? With him. That's what a committed follower does. But some folks are just Johnny and Janet come later. As long as I'm with this group, I can do what you say. I can talk the talk. Amen. Hallelujah. I can pray like you. I can cry like you. I got four Bibles like you. I can just play the role, just going along and get along. Following blindly. And that's where sometimes, sometimes people in some churches end up doing right off the cliff. What did God tell us to do to run? When somebody comes up telling you things that are contrary, whether it's a, a stranger, a prophet, or even if it's one of your family members, God said, what? Don't follow after that. Don't be committed to that foolishness. Do what? Commit to me. That's what he was telling him in Deuteronomy that we read already this morning, chapter 13, 1 through 11. That's all God was saying. Be careful. Folks are going to want to lead you, and unfortunately the mass is just in droves. Do what? Just run and fall right off the cliff. Not realizing the demands of discipleship, the cost. And it requires us to follow our leader, to be that committed follower of Jesus Christ. And that's the whole key thing about it, is being committed. Committed means there are going to be some things I have to give up. You know, something may happen, and Mama, I would love to. I, I can't. I can't make the family unit share because I, you know, Lord has got me. Well, baby, you you always, this is what we've done. For, yeah, Mama, but, you know, you know, half the folks I come to see, like, they ain't gonna, you know, they ain't right no way. I mean, you know, really, come on. I, I love you, but I can't make it. This one, I've done this for 50 years, Mama, and I can't miss one year. Of the family. Well, baby, you know, folks going to talk, and okay, who cares? Amen. Didn't they talk about Jesus and he was perfect? We see what they did to the disciples after they killed Jesus. When they put it on, they, they stoned poor Stephen. When Stephen put it on, they killed him. They didn't want to hear no more. I kill him. Because he was putting it on. The world is seeking to do the same to us today. Those of us who are committed, follow the Christ. They just want to kill us all. Want to quiet us whatever way they can. And the ultimate way to do that is to kill us all. Right? They can put us in this little organization, put us over here and squeeze in the corner. But guess what? We still going to sound off for of Jesus. Ultimately, that's why the ice speaker, that's why they want to do what? Just kill them all. Don't die. We don't want to hear it. Cut it off. Kill them all. 
But the world, Satan, seeks to do what? To squash us and push us away and try to quiet, try to quiet, try to quiet. It would seem like he realized that strategy ain't going to work, Satan. You tried that before. Look at what you did in the New Testament church. You tried that thing. It didn't work. Let him keep on trying. The pressure flames will do like this, and all it does is add gas to a fire that's already burning. Yeah. Do that. Pour it on there, brother. We'll spread this gospel anyway. We're praying this morning for people in Greece, amen, who have heard the word. Didn't Paul go there centuries ago? Yes, he did. We're still doing that. Even today, the word is still going forth. So we look at being a committed follower of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, right? That disciple again. So now, who are we following? We go now to Luke chapter 14. We're going to move forward now. Christ asked them to, to, to count the cost. He reminds them that I don't have a whole lot of stuff. You know, it's not going to be fun following me. And people want to do this and want to do that. Church folks, as we talk about following Jesus, realize there's some things worldly that may have to go what? Lacking. Worldly stuff, trivial things, tradition type stuff that may have to get left by the wayside. And guess what? If I'm committed to Jesus Christ and following him, I don't worry about that. In Luke chapter 14. Verse number 25. Now it says here, multitudes of large crowds were traveling with Jesus. And now again, he looked, and I've often thought that, look, man, when you got the, you know, folks, you, know, you got the crowd with you, you don't check them. You just keep that power. Come on, crowd. Yeah, let's go bumpers, whatever it is we're doing, right? I got the crowd. Anybody heard the news last week? Verizon, how many were 40,000, so many, some thousand of workers were uh, walking off picketing, right? Last week in Verizon, they trained some people to come in and take their job. But all these folks, that's power. Together. Can you imagine if somebody who was leading that little picket last week said, okay, now look, all y'all who are really scared about using y'all job, y'all going back. Yeah, it probably would have been a whole lot of people still out there picketing. You know, somebody would have thought, man, I still got bills due. You know, I, don't, you know, I, I mean, I'm, I'm with y'all now. I'm, yeah, they, they sure could pay us more, but I do appreciate this little whatever I'm getting right now, right? Some are nervous and would probably turn back around, but nobody in a crowd or a crowd of people is going to do that. That goes against the world's thinking. But look at what Jesus did. As he says, he has multitudes of large crowd. Jesus wants to check him. He wants to make sure that he doesn't have anybody like this He's following him. No haphazard. Why am I doing it? It's fun. Now, Jesus wants committed following. So what does he say? He says, if anyone comes to me but loves his father, mother, wife, children, brothers or sisters, or even his life more than me, or if you hate it, not is what the King James said. If you do this more than me, you can't be my father. Mm. Doesn't say that you don't love your mama, don't love it. It said, no, if you love them more than me, Jesus says you cannot be my father, my disciple. Whoever is not willing to carry the cross and follow me cannot be my father. If you want to build a town, you first sit down and decide how much it will cost to see if you have enough money to finish the job. The job. Count up the cost. That's what Christ is saying. That's what we're going to be reminding us as we look at our new study on next week about discipleship and being a disciple. It's counting up the cost. Weighing it out. Because it costs us something. Even more so now. I mean, in these days, it's costing us something. Folks, later in the city, you got people banning, uh, <laughs> banning whole states now right. because of principles contained in the scripture. Amen? Amen. Hello, Bruce Springsteen. I'm going to cancel my concert in this state because y'all passed this law. Hello, Brian Adams. I'm canceling my concert in Mississippi because y'all got this law on the book. The governor of uh, Carolina went back and he did something. I hope he didn't go back and rescind it. He went and did something to the law last week and whatever, whatever. All these businesses in Georgia. Well, Georgia, if y'all do this, we're going to leave, okay? Somebody's got to stand up. Count up the cost. Now, I mean, if, if you're a believer, now, now if I'm a believer and I happen to be the governor, guess what? I'm a believer first who happens to be the governor. Or the mayor. I'm a believer first who happens to be a pastor and somebody's daddy and an employee. But first comes my belief in Jesus Christ. I am committed to the cross of Jesus. That's who I'm following. I'm not following after a company. I love my little company. I'm a loyal employee. I'm a good employee. I'm a faithful employee. But guess what? When it comes to company or Christ, Christ comes first. Christ is the one who sent me. Christ is the one who made the company for me to get to. Right. Gives me strength to get to the company every day to do what I'm supposed to do. So when it comes to who I'm following, yeah. I'm following Jesus Christ first and foremost. So Jesus said, if you love all men more than me, you can't be my disciple. Who's not willing to carry his cross, you can't be my disciple. If you want to build a tower, do you not first count up the cost? Yeah. If you don't, you might lay the foundation, but you would not be able to finish. Then all you would see, or then all who, excuse me, would see it would make fun of you saying, this person began to build, but wasn't able to finish. If a king is going to fight, so let's take it to another round. 
not only in the building world, but if you have a leader, the leader is going to fight another king, first he will sit down and complain. You don't just jump into war and fight and all willy nilly. He will decide if he and his 10,000 soldiers can defeat the other king who has 20,000 soldiers. The numbers may be against us. But guess what, church? Our Savior, our divine, our captain of the host, that's what the Bible calls him, Jesus, the captain of the host, has already considered and has a strategy. Satan may have his thousands and millions or whatever. It's all right. It only took God but Gideon how many? 300. It's not about numbers. But see, we have a military strategist that's already planned this thing out. So you don't have to run out there half cocked. And you know, it's amazing. But you see, sometimes in old war movies, somebody gets upset. Ah, they go run out there with their gun. And bam, first one. Shot right in the head. Why? They forgot their training. They didn't think. You look and see, where is that fire coming from? Get out, it's a press fire, something. You just run out there yelling and screaming. You're saying, look at me, ah, bam. You end up the first one dead. Wow. Casualty of war. Right? And you lay down, they put a dog tag on you, body bag, and that's it. And Woo, keep going fighting. Right? But Christ says, count up the cost. So even a king or even a leader should do this. If he can, then while the other king is still far away, he will send some people to speak to him and ask for peace. In the same way, you must give up everything you have to be my father. Everything. Commit it. Everything. The demands of discipleship, how much does it cost you? It costs everything. What did it cost Jesus to save us? Everything. Amen. Everything. All he had. He already said he didn't have a place. So he didn't have a house to give him. He couldn't bargain with the people and say, well, look, man, I got this house over here. I got this, this summer home. Y'all can have it. Y'all He didn't have anything. That, what he had was his life. Didn't have no whole lot of money, no investments, no portfolio. He didn't have slaves, land, cattle. He didn't have any of that kind of stuff. All he had was his one perfect life to give. And it was worth so much more than anything else. And he gave. All that he had is what he gave for you and I. And now he simply asked, Robert, if you're going to follow me, son, count up the cost. Yeah. There are some demands. It's not just you just all of a sudden see somebody else in line and get behind them and think we're going to end up at the destination. Mm -hmm. You need to be a committed follower. In that line, as you follow that leader, and you, the leader of should be following what? Me? You need to count up the cost, son. You can't be back there following, oh, Lord, when it's going to be over. Oh, man, I think, you know, just going along. That's what we see in our church today, in our world today. Folks just follow the whole time. They follow, they're kicking us free. Don't be more. I mean, if that's the case, go ahead on back. You go on back and do what you need to do, man. Go on and handle your business, as we would say. Christ wants committed. As a disciple of Christ, we should be committed and that commitment has to be one that you make. If anybody, I mean, see, so I'm not, and this church is going to get you to sign some document or some contract and I agree to follow Jesus. Man, please, that's between you and the Lord. And that level of commitment is here anyway. I mean, you can show us a whole lot of stuff, just like in that line. Everybody in that line looks like they're doing the right thing, right? They all in step. But in their heart, somebody's thinking, man, when it's going to be over, Lord, why am I here? You know, that's what's going on there. And God sees all of that. In our churches today, many churches today, around the world, around this country, today, folks are sitting in pews, nodding heads, amen, Bibles open, singing hymns, whatever, whatever, but their heart ain't bit more there. Mm. All they're doing is they in that line, they follow the leader, but they don't bit more know why they're there. They don't feel anything. Mm. The love of God isn't there. There's no touching of the Holy Spirit. They feel in the Spirit, all right. It ain't the Holy Spirit. Mm. It's emotion, it's this, it's just that they, their blood pressure is high, whatever, they feel whatever. It's just something going on in there. Their sugar may be low, and they think they're feeling something. All they're doing is emotion. No true commitment. True commitment means denying and giving up all. Jesus says, I just want to repeat it again. In the same way, you must give up everything you have to be my father. And the, the beautiful thing about it is that in giving up on that stuff, God has something else, what? For us. Doesn't it? God has something better for all you know. This little stuff we have on this side, we think is oh so great. And, but I worked hard to get this. Man, you just don't know. This is a collectible. Okay, whatever. What happens if it's destroyed in the fire? The thief comes in and steals it and takes it. Collectible what? What is it good for? Well, we get so caught up in stuff. And really, it's because of the value other folks place on it. We, it makes us feel what? Oh, oh man, they, they say that's a short, that's a good one now. And I'm looking at what? Whether I like it or not, I'm thinking about what other people think. It's not about that. We should be committed not to the world, other people, father, mother, all this other kind of stuff. Christ said to let that kind of stuff go. We want to be committed to following him. So the question is, you know, and who are you following? Who want to be following the true leader, who is Jesus Christ? Amen. If I'm going to follow somebody, and there again, now guess what? If I'm one of these little fish back here, I'm, I'm following the green fish. Well, yeah, the green fish, but I'm following the red fish. Well, yeah, but I'm following the blue fish. But ultimately, who should we be following? Right. So, if, so if I'm following you to get to him, that's all right. 
That's what the scripture said. Follow me as I follow Christ. But see, if you follow me, if I follow a green fish, and he said, man, look, I want some more green. Let's go have us a green fish club and take off from the evening. I can't do that. I need to follow what? The truth. My eyes, as I look, as I look at the green field, they be looking past him to see Jesus. And there again, being committed, I mean, just seriously, church, not, not committed to me, to this building, to this church. No, nah, you be committed to Jesus Christ. And if, if Brother Robert can help lead you in that direction, okay, then come follow me as I follow Jesus Christ. And I share with you again. If I step down or stumble, you better step, Brother Robert, I'm sure you all right down there, man? All right, kid. Jesus, I come. You better keep on stepping and follow him. Right? Because if I am indeed, and I fall, I falter, Lord, Lord forbid. it. But Lord, probably I can get up and get right back on track. I may have to be behind you then. You know, hold up and see, I'm coming, I'm coming. And I'm going to get right back in line. But don't you get bogged down because one thing. Mm -hmm, you be committed to Jesus Christ. Not to a person, individual, an ideal. Be committed to Jesus Christ. The scripture we read already, the account we read in Peter. Right? When he asked Jesus, Lord, we have given up all. What are we going to get? And Jesus had to break it down and share it with him. Right? Because when we talk about people following Jesus Christ, we talk about the demands of discipleship. And in following the leader, I want to read one scripture to you really quick. And I read this, and I believe before, but in 2 Timothy chapter 4. Everybody who follows, who starts out with us, right? 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10. I'm going to read verse 9 first. 2 Timothy 4 and 9 says, do your best. He's right to Timothy. Do your best to come to me as soon as you can. Why? Because Demas, who loved this world, left me and went to Thessalonica. Cretans went to Galatia. Titus went to Dalmatia. Luke is the only one still with me. Get Mark and bring, but what he's saying here is these people who love this world, they were following after me, but they love this other stuff, they're not with me anymore. So it's not about people. You see, somebody can be following and look at the poor, but the love of the world and the lust of the world and what the world has to offer, they can kind of just slide in there, and lo and behold, there you're left. That's why it's not good to put your hope and trust in people. My true leader is Jesus Christ. That's why he told us to what? Count up the cost. There's some demands on this discipleship thing. You can't just call yourself a disciple because you follow me. There's it's, it's called being a committed follower to all the precepts and principles that I teach. It's not just you know it's not just staying the step. That's too easy. That's like we can go back to nursery school with that. That's just plain old follow the leader. Jesus going over there. All right, Jesus, here I come. But Jesus going over there and he's praying as he goes. No, I'm just what mm -hmm. I need to do. What pray as I go. Jesus goes and he's studying the scripture as he goes. I need to go and do what? Study the scripture as I go. It's not as simple as just getting in line and follow the leader and doing like the leader does. I want to be who that leader is. I want to be just like Jesus. I want to be a Christian, Christ-like, in more than me. Yes. I want that to be part of my deportment, part of the way I carry and conduct myself, right? To be that Christian, yes. right? To be that disciple, that committed follower of Jesus Christ. So there's some demands on discipleship. That's what we're going to look at as we begin our new study on this next Tuesday. We talk about being a disciple of Christ and what that entails. We're going to look at those demands. I mean, seriously, anybody can jump up and say, I want to be and I want to do it. Okay, fine. As the church, we should share with them. It's going to cost you something. What? But we can go back here and share some of these examples in Scripture we looked at this morning. All right? There's other examples. Go to Matthew chapter 8. There are other examples where Christ said, look, you got to put this away. you got to do that. And a lot of folks are honestly not going to be able to do it. Right here in what we read in chapter 9, the rich ruler, he said, just give up your stuff. The man left saying, hmm. he couldn't do it. They're getting, just like demons. The world had too much of a hold on them. And unfortunately, it's going to be that way with some people. There's just two. They, got, they feel they have too much to lose hmm, worldwide. But what is it profit? Hmm. A man to gain the entire or the whole world and lose your soul. That's the only one you have. Right? What does it profit you? So, demands of discipleship. And with that, let's be, of course, the tie that binds you and I together and binds our hearts in Christian love. 1 John chapter 4, verse 11. That's what? If God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. If he loved us. There's two verses? No, no. Oh, two verses. Okay. Uh, bless, uh, beloved God. Okay. Our song is 